Uh, Jim, your program, uh, Substance Use and Mental Health, has recently released a study uh, on the mental health needs of those arrested in D.C. Mm. Um, what were your findings? The work we were conducting in D.C., the basic aim of the research was to um, find out how many people who were arrested in Washington, D.C. Um, had a mental health need. And what we found was, is when we took information from a range of sources and compiled it together, about a third of people who were arrested during that month um, had some indication of mental health needs. Um, and this was information that wasn't available before because different agencies had different pieces of the puzzle based on their own services, but there wasn't a comprehensive marker in this kind of way. While most of the criminal justice agencies um, that provided data knew of, or at least one of those agencies knew of a mental health need, for 40% of the people arrested during that month, they had no contact with Department of Mental Health licensed services. So they weren't in contact with um, mental health services in the community, which to us suggests that there is a lapse in terms of referring people who are identified when they're in contact with the criminal justice system and ensuring they receive mental health services once they have left the jail or finished their period of probation supervision. Your study found that um, although some individuals who are arrested who are struggling with mental health needs are um, identified by one agency, um, that they pass through the other agencies without receiving um, the kind of mental health services that they need. Um, how did that, how does that happen? Many people pass through contact with criminal justice agencies extremely quickly and there may be disincentives for them to disclose their mental health needs uh, and of course um, often identifying someone's health needs is not the main priority of justice agencies and so I think for a combination of factors um, people, as you say, do tend to kind of pass through contact and not have their needs identified and not receive the treatment that, that, could, that could benefit them. Um, also, agencies operate often in a siloed way, and I think that's particularly the case when you're looking at communication between health and justice agencies. These agencies don't work well together. They're, they don't have a history of coordinating care. And so when people are moving from criminal justice settings to the community, there's not always that handoff. Um, which would allow people to kind of receive the kind of seamless care that they need. In your experience working with people with serious mental illness in the community, uh, what are the barriers to identifying their treatment needs? Well, in my experience, the issue is not so much identifying their treatment needs. The, the issue is getting them in mm. in the first place so that they could be evaluated. Um, the problem being that so many people uh, who suffer from serious mental illnesses um, don't know that they're suffering mm. is the result of an illness that can be treated and so that they never present for mental health services. Mm. You know, if they would do that, um, then I think the evaluation and identification of treatment needs uh, could be possible. How could your findings be used to improve services for people who suffer from mental illness in D.C.? We think that there's opportunities to identify people earlier before they become entrenched in the system. So targeting people at the, first, at the point of first arrest, for example, or the first arrest on a particular charge is one way that, that you could do that. And the second area is around um, the issue of information sharing. So I mentioned before that there are barriers to coordinating services. Um, I think there are many opportunities to, I, to Im improve identification if agencies were able to um, share information on treatment needs. Um, and we looked at this in our analysis and found that for example, if the jail received information from other agencies, they could radically increase the number of people who they knew had treatment needs and then use that as an entree to providing services to them. But do you think it's possible to overcome some of these barriers to information sharing? I think that, um, that it's possible in using certain kind of methods and in discrete cases. So for example, um, in DC, the jail and the Department of Mental Health have a, an arrangement where someone from the Department of Mental Health is at the jail looking through jail records to identify somebody who's on um, the Department of Mental Health's client list they're receiving services as a way then of linking that person with their psychiatrist or their um, treatment provider in the community. Um, so I think the range of information sharing opportunities goes from those which are very local and very specific up to more ambitious kind of um, uh, information sharing initiatives and of course there are a range of ethical considerations. So um, you probably would never want to share someone information on someone's drug use, for example, um, with um, a, a police agency because of concerns about what that information could be used for. But within those legal and ethical parameters, I think there's lots of room to improve the way that agencies work together. Uh, what do you think that the criminal justice system could learn from community psychiatric practice? 
Well, I think there's two major things that, that might be helpful. Um, one is this notion of delivering ethnoculturally competent um, mental health services, be they evaluations or treatment services. This is particularly an issue, I think, in prisons, uh, where prisons tend to be in some remote area of the state. The inmates are from someplace totally different. And the mental health professionals in the prisons only see people from that community who are in prison. So they have no um, real sense of how ethnicity and culture influences the human behavior of this population and therefore take that into consideration in the provision of mental health services. And so I think that a move towards more ethnoculturally competent mental health services in the prisons and jails would be helpful. The second thing is that a big part of the delivery of community mental health services is education. Um, helping people to uh, understand one that they have an illness, what is the nature of that illness, how they can monitor themselves, what is the role of treatment. And it's so clear that that increases compliance with treatment and people staying in treatment. Um, and if there was more opportunity for that type of psychoeducation within the jails and prisons, then I think it'd be more likely when people are released that they would seek and continue to receive mental health services. Health and justice professionals around the country face the same difficulties to information sharing that you found in D.C. Are there things from your research that could be helpful in uh, other areas? The Substance Use and Mental Health Program at Vera is setting up uh, an online resource. We call it the Justice and Health Data Exchange um, Initiative as a way of providing information to others in different parts of the country who want to kind of get their arms around um, what they can and can't do in terms of information sharing. Um, and hopefully that will uh, increase um, initiatives in this kind of area. What additional opportunities um, do you see for improved uh, communication between justice and health systems? I think having met someone who you're going to see when you get out mm. uh, makes all the difference. And, um, and that's, I think, what's important, as opposed to a cold referral where you, know, you just give somebody a slip of paper and say, show up here when you get out. Right. You know, it's just not going to happen. Right. Um, but you know, when you've met that person and they say, you know, I'll see you when you get out, uh, and I'm right down the street from where you live, um, that's a totally different uh, uh, referral experience. Of course, identifying people in the community before they're arrested and providing services um, to help prevent criminal justice involvement is, um, is, is what we would advocate for and, um, and, and what we would like to see happen. Thank you, Rick, for coming here today and for, for talking with me and giving your feedback on our report. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you.